When you think of 90s first-person shooters, titles like Goldeneye, Doom, and Perfect Dark probably come to mind. And if you had a PlayStation, there's a good chance Medal of Honor is on that list too. The groundbreaking series, created by DreamWorks Interactive and spearheaded by Steven Spielberg, set out to do something different. Deliver a fun, action-packed game while also educating players about World War II. It was an ambitious concept, especially in an era dominated by sci-fi shooters. But it resonated with players. In fact, I had a friend in high school who swore the original Medal of Honor was his favorite FPS of all time. A few years later, after being acquired by EA, the series struck gold again with the release of Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Allied Assault sold and reviewed extremely well at the time of release, gathering very many near-perfect ratings. Though despite that success, Medal of Honor struggled to engage audiences into the 2000s. After EA had made the decision to develop future Medal of Honor games in-house, the team that worked on Allied Assault would be recruited by Activision to make the Medal of Honor killer, Call of Duty. Medal of Honor titles would still be released, but not as frequently, and with significantly less critical acclaim. The series saw relative success with 2007's Medal of Honor Airborne, but by that point, gamers were feeling a bit of World War II fatigue. This was emphasized by the success of Call of Duty 4, fittingly titled Modern Warfare. EA knew that if they wanted to continue to compete with Activision, they would need to ramp up production on their FPS titles. That's how EA Los Angeles would become Danger Close Games, a team dedicated to developing Medal of Honor titles. Their first foray into modern combat would be the 2010 reboot, simply titled Medal of Honor. It seemed to be a trend in the late 2000s and early 2010s to reboot something and just title it the same as the original. I never really understood this because fans will always just say the 2010 reboot or put 2010 in parentheses after the title. Or in Halloween's case, just call it the Rob Zombie one. Now I think I played this game once when I was younger, but I only remember getting to the third mission or so and just quitting entirely. So this is my first time playing through the entire game. And I'm not gonna lie, I think this might be one of the most underrated FPS games of this era. I would argue that there are elements of this game that rival even that of the Modern Warfare series, and that's not a claim I make lightly. Medal of Honor 2010 was developed by Danger Close Games and released across the seventh generation of consoles. The single player and multiplayer modes were actually split up during development, with Danger Close Games helming the campaign in Unreal Engine 3, while EA's DICE handled multiplayer in the Frostbite engine. While games like Call of Duty created fictionalized versions of Modern War to drop their cast of characters into, Medal of Honor decided to stick to their roots of historical accuracy and set their game in the aftermath of September 11th. So, how does it hold up to its peers? Let's dig into the single player and find out. Medal of Honor opens fairly strong with First In, in which you assume control of Rabbit, a member of a Tier 1 group of operators called AFO Team Neptune. If we're drawing comparisons to Call of Duty, we could say that Neptune is kind of like the Task Force 141 of this game, as the majority of the game focuses on these four characters. Team Neptune has been deployed to interview an ex-Taliban contact named Tariq. Unfortunately, things don't go as planned. During the campaign, you have access to two primary weapon slots and a handgun, which I like because it allows for variety in combat. Games that only give you a primary and a sidearm rob you of the greatest joy in life. Backup shotgun. Medal of Honor has a terrorist problem. 
and the solution is shotgun shells. I'm going to talk about these first because they are insanely overpowered. I know shotguns have mid-range viability in real life, but you never really see that translate to video games. It was nice to have a gun that I could use to sweep tight corners and also headshot people from 50 feet away. Most of the rifles allow you to adjust your fire modes between automatic and semi-automatic, and I found myself alternating between these quite a bit depending on the circumstance. In the single player mode, you don't get to choose what attachments you have on your gun, but they do vary by mission. I found myself using a majority of the weapons at least once throughout the campaign. I'll be making a lot of comparisons to Modern Warfare 2 because I feel like that was the baseline for modern style shooters when this was released. The guns in Medal of Honor feel heavier and a bit more powerful than the guns in the Modern Warfare series. Under certain circumstances, shotguns, sniper rifles, LMGs, and anything explosive can blow enemies to pieces. I first realized this while using the shotgun during the opening level and it quickly became my favorite way to play. I only wish there were more close quarters fights because I will never get tired of this. Despite being a Call of Duty style first person shooter, Medal of Honor plays like it wants to be a cover shooter. Charging in the open areas is usually ill-advised and the enemy AI will surround you and kill you fairly quickly. To help emphasize the importance of using cover, Medal of Honor incorporates some pretty polished leaning mechanics. Utilizing them is pretty essential considering the alternative is strafing a corner and risking getting shot in the face. There were some elements that pulled me out of the realism a bit. I wasn't a big fan of the icon indicating headshots at the bottom of the screen. It felt out of place in a game that was otherwise trying to maintain an illusion of realism. There is already an audio cue that plays when you get a headshot, so the UI notification wasn't really necessary. As far as opening missions go, I liked First In a lot. It's fast paced, filled with action, demonstrates the main mechanics well, and does a great job at setting expectations going forward. The Modern Warfare games typically open with a training segment of sorts, and while I feel it fits those games, I really like just being dropped into the action. After Team Neptune recovers Tariq, he informs them that the Taliban, yeah, that Taliban, don't worry, we'll talk about that later, have between 500 and 1,000 combatants in the Shahikot Valley. That intel would carry us into the rest of the campaign, but not before Neptune is tasked with securing the Bagram airfield, in a mission that caused my game to crash six times. The mission opens with a full assault on the airfield as Team Neptune flanks through some ruins to take out some enemy emplacements. This is the first time you get to use the SOFLAM, a device I only know from video games. I feel like the military guys are going to give me so much shit in the comments, but please bear with me. But essentially, it's a laser pointer used to designate targets. During a sequence at the end of the mission, you use the SOFLAM to hold back advancing enemy combatants, and this was extremely painful. Randomly, during this segment, my game would just stop working. I had no idea what was happening during this sequence, so I reinstalled the game like four times, checked online for some fixes, and eventually installed a patch from some sketchy website that replaced my EXE file, and the game worked. Then we get our first of many cutscenes, taking place in some sort of operations base, and they really illustrate the tensions between leadership and later demonstrate some incredible incompetence. Barker, this is Colt 2 one We seem to be taking some fire. Do you have eyes on our grid? Incoming! Incoming! Barker, we have been engaged! Request immediate assistance. Cease fire! Cease fire! Those are friendlies! These cutscenes show up every few missions and work to connect the other playable characters to Team Neptune. Next, we meet Team Wolfpack containing team leader Panther, Vegas, Dusty, and the playable character Deuce. Running with wolves is actually the first of the stealth missions in this game, and I'll be honest, I have no fucking idea how I was supposed to complete this stealthily. It seemed damn near impossible to not be seen. 
Maybe I was doing something wrong, but who knows. After planting some bombs on some trucks, we hightail it out of there in our ATVs, which felt very reminiscent of the snowmobile chase in Modern Warfare 2. Our time with Team Wolfpack is cut short as we go back to playing as Rabbit in the mission Dorothy's a Bitch. We get another bit of stealth before going loud and infiltrating a small village full of combatants. One enemy is able to get a flare off before dying and there's suddenly a lot of radio chatter. I was expecting an all out war at this point, but it turns out Neptune wasn't compromised. It was instead Reaper 3-1, the local AC-130. Now you should be familiar with the AC-130 from the mission in Modern Warfare. In a bit of cool crossover between missions, Neptune encounters the trucks that Deuce and Dusty had tagged, and Reaper 3-1 blows them to hell. You clean up the remaining resistance, taking pot shots at Reaper 3-1, and then it's off to the belly of the beast to play as the third playable character, Army Ranger Specialist Dante Adams. Belly of the Beast was probably my favorite mission. For one, Adams starts with an LMG, and I suddenly remembered how great it can feel to spray and pray when your magazine has a hundred rounds. Belly of the Beast follows a squad of Army Rangers as they lead an assault against the Taliban. The firefights in this mission are probably some of the best in the game and not just because of the LMG. The enemy AI is on full display here, often flanking you, tossing grenades, and generally just being fucking annoying. Towards the end of the mission, your squad gets caught in the blast radius of an IED. Fortunately, nobody dies, but Adams does get a bit disoriented. Upon regaining consciousness, the bleak reality of the situation begins to set in. This was an ambush, and you're being overrun. A seemingly endless amount of Taliban combatants flood over the hilltops and surround your position. Air support isn't available, and just as all hope seems lost, two Apache helicopters swing in at the last moment and wipe the hillside clean. The ending of this mission was insanely intense. The position you're forced into is extremely exposed. You have to constantly be watching out for enemies flanking you, Ammo is running low, and it seems like you won't be making it out of here alive. After rescuing the rangers from the depths of hell, the gunships fly off to complete their other objectives, with you taking control of Gunfighter 1-1's cannons for the next mission, aptly titled Gunfighters. This whole section of the game felt a little silly to me, especially after the ending of the last mission. Let me just walk you through my thoughts up to this point. We go from probably one of the most intense encounters I've played in any shooter to an on-the-rails shooter with a rock soundtrack. Completely shatters the pacing of the game. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy the mission or the characters, because I did. It just completely threw me off. I was joking with friends in Discord that this felt like what the army would use to try and recruit people. I don't know, it just felt silly. Picking back up with Deuce and Dusty, Friends from Afar is a rather short mission that mostly has you looking through the scope of a sniper rifle and eliminating targets on the hillside. Dusty gives you instructions about the wind speed and distance, but I don't think any of that actually matters here because I was able to just put my crosshair on the enemy and take them out. Maybe Deuce adjusts for what Dusty is telling him? I'm not sure because I'm not. The mission ends with the duo, sometimes called Double D, providing sniper support for a pinned down Team Neptune. Compromised plays a lot like Belly of the Beast. In this mission, we pick back up as Team Neptune as we're being overrun by the Taliban. This section is full of more intense shootouts as Team Neptune is forced downhill to their evacuation point. There are a few close calls, but before Voodoo and Preacher can get to the helicopter, it takes RPG fire and loses an engine, forcing the pilot to flee, leaving the two behind. I just want to emphasize again how powerful these heavy weapons feel. If there's anything this game mastered, it was the gunplay. Neptune's Nest is another of my favorite missions, and this is as close to an all gillied up style stealth mission in this game. 
Despite being advised against it, Mother and Rabbit redeploy to search for Voodoo and Preacher. But during the redeployment, they're forced to jump from the helicopter as it starts taking fire, leaving the player without a gun. The first kill you get with the knife has a pretty janky execution animation, and the rest of the enemies kind of just drop to the ground. It would have been nice to see something a bit more polished here for a stealth section, but the gunplay once again makes up for it. But fortunately, this mission doesn't have a happy ending, as Rabbit gets shot a bunch of times and the duo jump off of a ledge, only to be surrounded and captured by the enemy. Rescue the Rescuers is the final mission, and god damn it, it is difficult. I think I died more times during this mission than I did the rest of the game. You're back with the army rangers, filling the boots of Specialist Adams. The mission concludes with the team finding Mother and Rabbit. Unfortunately, Rabbit's injuries prove to be fatal and he doesn't make it. The story wraps up with a cutscene, Preacher holding Rabbit's lucky charm, and Mother remarking that this isn't how it ends. I'd have to say that overall, Medal of Honor really surprised me, and there's a lot to love about this game. The highlights here for me are the gunplay, the combat, and the soundtrack. The weapons feel great, the enemy AI is relentless, and the background music makes it sound like you're in a war movie more than a video game. I don't know what else I could ask for in a shooter. There was a multiplayer mode for this game, but as of this review it seems like the servers have been shut down. So instead of reviewing the multiplayer, instead I'll talk about the controversy surrounding it. Since this game is partly historical fiction, the developers decided to include the Taliban in the game, and in the multiplayer. Veterans were not happy that players could control Taliban combatants and kill US soldiers, and the United States military actually barred the game from being sold on their bases as a result of it. EA would change the team name to Opposing Forces, but it seems as if the damage had already been done. I guess that's probably a big reason why Call of Duty tries to steer clear of basing their modern games on actual wars and conflicts. Medal of Honor 2010 would forever be a standalone title, with EA pulling out and putting all of their money into the Battlefield franchise. And boy did that turn out well. This would be Danger Close Games' one and only title, and I think there could be worse accomplishments. You know, like, I don't know, releasing a sequel that is so bad it kills the entire franchise for a decade. <coughs> Alright, look, I tried to play Warfighter. Believe me, it's unplayable. I really tried. I wanted to like it. I was blown away by this game. All I wanted more than anything was to enjoy Warfighter, but it's just not good. I won't even say as good, but it's just not good at all. The FOV is capped so low with virtually no way to change it that I just, I couldn't. I could not play the game. Maybe I'll try it again in the future, but not right now. I just don't have it in me. At the end of the day, I think what the majority of people are looking for in a video game is to be entertained. Maybe not League of Legends players, but that's a video for a different day. Medal of Honor plays well. The firefights are set up in an interesting way. The campaign doesn't drag on any longer than it needs to. I wish that EA hadn't shut down the servers because I would have loved to give the multiplayer a shot, but I guess that's what I get for waiting so long. This is definitely a game I could see myself playing again, and I think if you're a fan of first person shooters, it's worth checking out at the very least. Well, that's all for the only Medal of Honor game set in the modern war era. If you enjoyed this and want to support the channel, feel free to hit the subscribe button with a Predator missile, or your mouse cursor, that works too. Thanks for watching.